Hello and welcome back to Insiders Unreported Europe, where we bring you stories from the fault lines of Europe. This month we travel to Chemnitz, Germany. The town has gained a reputation for being a hotbed for extremism. Why? We'll find out by watching your report. Ayman, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Sophie. So let's watch it and do stay with us afterwards. I'll be talking to Ayman about his experience in the field. Once a model socialist town named Karl Marx City, Chemnitz in the East German state of Saxony has witnessed dramatic political changes over the years. In front of this statue, less than 30 years ago, citizens of Chemnitz protested for the fall of a totalitarian regime. Last August, however, a very different kind of protest happened here. Violent anti-immigrant riots that turned Chemnitz into the symbol of Germany's newly assertive far right. It started here when a German man was stabbed to death. The alleged killers, two refugees from Iraq and Syria. A week of angry anti-immigrant protests followed with neo-Nazis, far-right groups and thousands of ordinary citizens marching together. The protests stand as a watershed moment in the outpouring of anti-immigrant hatred that has swelled as Germany's far-right grows bolder and stronger following the 2015 migrant crisis. At the heart of Germany's newly assertive far right is the AFD, Alternative for Germany, a populist anti-immigrant party. The AFD has only been around for six years, but already achieved stunning success, becoming the third largest party in the Bundestag. Its leader, Alexander Gauland, who's from Chemnitz, speaking about the violence there last year. On top of that, so many of these refugees break the law. It's enough with patience. Martin Schulz, former leader of the centre-left party, the SPD, was outraged. This is the kind of language we heard in this parliament a very long time ago. It's time for the Democrats in this country to stand up again. It's rhetorical rearmament. We joined the AFD at a rally in Chemnitz. They are campaigning for the European elections. We spoke to their candidate, Maximilian Krah. The AFD has been incredibly successful in just six years. Yes. Do you think part of that success, or a big part of that success, is because of the migration crisis in 2015? Obviously. Obviously. I mean, it, it would be a lie to deny it. The, Germany was, was a kind of a peaceful place outside of all troubles we have globally. And then Merkel decided to, to, to open the country and to let in almost a little bit less than one million mostly uh, Muslim, most, mostly uh, masculine immigrants in one year. And that has changed the country. And uh, we are the only political force that is in opposition towards that mass migration. Uh, but we know from the polls that, that almost 50% of the population is against that mass immigration. So obviously it, it was a boom. The AFD's anti-immigration platform resonates deeply with German voters opposed to Chancellor Angela Merkel's welcoming policy towards refugees. It's exactly this kind of scum who are thrown out of their countries that arrive here. And these parasites are feasting at my expense. It's quite shocking to hear some of the language used by some AFD supporters here, calling the left parasites, refugees, insects. This is the kind of language we haven't heard in Germany spoken out loud since the darkest days of German fascism. So the AFD are having their rally right here behind us. There's a column of policemen here, and just on the other side is the counter-protest. Only about 100 metres apart are the two polarised groups of German politics. Like most cities in Germany, Chemnitz is divided. As the AFD held their rally, large crowds of their opponents marched through the streets. Green, liberal and left-wing protesters demanding to be heard and to counter the AFD's show of force. How do you feel about the rise of nationalist parties like the AFD in your town? Well, I'm not really sure if they are on the rise. I'm, I'm personally thinking that they are, were always here, but now they are more confident and uh, yeah, are coming out. 
and, and claiming uh, that they control the town and that simply not true. There was an additional political event that day. Pro Chemnitz, the right-wing citizens' movement that organized last year's anti-immigrant protests, were having a community barbecue to celebrate the opening of their new offices. Just like at the AFD rally, however, their event drew a loud counter-protest outside, with police having to separate the two groups. That's quite a welcome you have outside. Yes, that's our best friends from the left, left wing extremists and they had, they gave us a big welcome in the morning when they put acid on our entrance. They put and acid on your entrance. Yes. Germany traditionally has been a place where they're, you're proud not to be proud and you don't talk very patriotic. And you think this is changing and Germany is becoming a more patriotic? It was never this way here in, in, in the former GDR. It has its, its roots uh, in the re-education after the war. Because uh, the, in the West, they were, they were told or taught by the Americans and in English that uh, the, the German thinking, German kind of living and thinking led to the crimes of National Socialism. And here we had the Russians and they told us, oh, that the capitalism was the bad thing that leads to fascism. Uh, so we were not educated this way that being German is a big problem. Historically, East Germany was a far more homogenous society than the West, and notably missing amongst all the sausages, beer and folk songs at the barbecue were foreign faces. To get a better understanding of life for immigrants in Chemnitz, we met with 13-year-old Hassan al Nasser, an Iraqi refugee who came here with his family five years ago. Hassan wants to be an architect when he grows up, but says he will move to Berlin, as he's tired of the racism in Chemnitz. I experienced an incident on the tram. An elderly man was filming a Muslim woman and I told him to stop. And then he started filming me and other people from different cultural backgrounds too. The situation escalated and he screamed to us that Hitler should put us in the gas chamber, just like back then. Hassan is not the only one struggling with prejudice in Chemnitz. Libyan refugee Leila Ahmed says she experiences a racist incident nearly every week. I've lost five years. The main reason I came here was for safety and as a woman with a child, but I don't feel safe at all. We face the same situation as we faced in Libya and even more. I left Libya because I was struggling psychologically and I was scared for my son, but I found the same in Germany. My feeling about Libya is that at least it's my country, regardless of the situation. There was some kind of respect for people as human beings. Here you are a stranger. I left and sacrificed everything, took a dangerous journey to keep my son safe. So the most basic right for me is when I'm walking down the street with my hijab. I'm scared that someone will hit me. I tell my son not to speak to people. Germany has registered over 1.2 million asylum seekers since 2015. Chemnitz, however, has a relatively small foreign-born population, only 8%. Yet rates of hate crimes against immigrants are higher here than in the rest of the country. We meet André Luscher, a social worker with an NGO that helps victims of racist violence. So in whole Saxony we have uh, 317 attacks. Um, from that, uh, nearly 80 uh, attacks have been here in Chemnitz. Okay, and that's an increase from the year before? Uh, it's increased about 40% from the year before in whole Saxony. And in wow. Chemnitz uh, it's about uh, 400%. We ask why he thinks anti-immigrant attitudes are hardening in Saxony. One important point is that the rise of migration in Germany moved the whole public debate towards the right. So the AFD took advantage of this and besides that they don't have much more to offer. This is their main topic that people are focusing on. 
drunter versammelt haben. Simmering anger about migration is turning into real violence in Chemnitz. We're meeting Masoud Hashemi, a political refugee from Iran who has a Persian restaurant here. Last October, three men dressed in black stormed the building. One man made this salute and said, Heil Hitler, and said it very loudly. And immediately he started to smash stuff. And he threw a samovar into my face. And when I moved away, I went into the kitchen. And then he destroyed the kitchen. And this man came and beat me. He kicked my stomach and I fell down to the ground. And my head was injured and a lot of blood came out. Masoud spent more than a week recovering in hospital. He still doesn't understand why he was attacked. Now I have work. I pay my insurances, I pay my rent, and so on. I'm working. Why do they come and beat me up? They come to me because I'm Persian. What have I done? It's not just immigrants who are the victims of far-right hate crimes. Last year, outside Chemnitz, a 27-year-old man was tortured to death for being homosexual. And in a really worrying sign of Germany's dark past rising up again, anti-Semitism is on the increase. Shalom, a kosher restaurant opened here in 2000. Its owner, Uwe Zubala, whose family survived the Holocaust, says that the place has been a target of anti-Semitic attacks. We asked whether the anti-Semitism of today could be compared to the 1930s. The economy was much more fragile. The breeding ground for nationalist thinking, in my opinion, was much more fertile. While today, compared to 1933, we have the opportunity of globalization, and due to this, there is a positive critical mass who are able to show democratic strength. The restaurant was attacked last August when a mob of around a dozen people hurled rocks, bottles and a metal pipe at the building. Uwe was hit by a large stone. It hit me in the shoulder. Without being too dramatic, if this stone had hit my head with full force, there could have been a very different ending. That's one of those small differences regarding your comparison to 1933. I called the police. And the police did come, and they did, in my opinion, a very professional job. And in 1933, probably the Jews had no chance to call the police. And in 1933, no Jews to call the police. It's our final day in Chemnitz and we're on the campaign trail with two AFD candidates for the upcoming municipal elections. Again, the central message seems to be one of immigration and integration. The Islam is in my eyes or in our eyes not integrationsfähig. Islam, in my opinion, cannot be integrated. We see this day by day because Arabic immigrants in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, they're loitering on the streets. They're attacking Germans every day with knives or beating them. There are so many of those events that we have to say that Islam is not fitting into Germany nor into Europe. I'm the son of an Arabic immigrant. Don't you think I've integrated well into European society? Is there a place for me here? I wouldn't have imagined this. <laughs> well done. I would say that you were integrated in your country. I suppose you're here for many years. What else can I say? We're at Chemnitz's central market doing a very unscientific poll about where people stand politically. I will vote for the AFD because there's no other alternative for me, because the old parties, all of them, left us alone and forgot us. 
The AFD is the worst party here. They don't have a heart. Everyone should have his own religion, but everyone who comes to Germany should adapt to the German culture. Chemnitz now has a reputation for being a far-right city. But after spending time here this week, I'm not entirely sure that's fair. It's true, hate crimes are rising, alongside casual racism and support for parties like the AFD. But it's a far cry from the 1930s. There's a lot of resistance and anger here towards the far right as well. The question is whether that will be enough to prevent the political centre from shifting in a country that is seen as the defender of a liberal and tolerant Europe. So, Ayman, uh, there were no like riots or violence while you were in Chemnitz, a far cry from what we saw last August. Does it mean everything has gone back to normal? Not quite. The streets might be quieter, but there's instances of the far right appearing quite strong in Chemnitz. Hate crimes, for example, are on the increase in Chemnitz in particular and in Saxony in general. Um, and groups like the Chemnitz Football Club's ultra group are known to have neo-Nazi ties and be more and more bold in the way they express themselves. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people in the city are tired of this reputation they have as being a far-right city, and I think it's fair to say the majority of people there aren't far-right supporters. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the AFD, uh, Germany's far-right party, is it enabling or even colliding with this um, extremist neo-Nazi groups? The AFD is often accused of having ties to neo-Nazis. It's something they vehemently deny. One thing that is undeniable, though, however, is as the AFD has risen over the last few years, so has the boldness um, of, of far-right extremist groups. Mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of political discourse, the centre now talks about ideas, xenophobic ideas, ideas of nationalism, of heimat, of homeland, that were taboo until recently. And so I think the political centre is shifting a little bit towards the right. Mm -hmm. But is it not happening in other Western democracies and surely in Eastern Europe as well? Sure, it's happening all over Europe, the rise of the right. Um, but it's particularly poignant and alarming in Germany, however, because of obviously the country's dark history with fascism and also its dominant position on the continent. Sure. Now, um, we have one of your characters uh, in your report saying that there are historically different take, uh, different takes at, at being a German in Eastern Germany and Western Germany, that it is okay to be proud uh, to be German, to be nationalistic about uh, Germany. Uh, now, is it fair to say also that the right and far right is more prominent in Eastern Germany than it is in Western Germany? Absolutely, the numbers prove it. The, the AFD and other parties like it poll a lot higher in the East than in the West. Um, as to why the East is more predominantly right, um, there's a lot of reasons. Economically, the East has been far less prosperous than the West. Um, one idea that I found intriguing, however, is this idea of a crisis of masculinity and male identity in the East. After the Berlin Wall fell, uh, East Germany lost 10% of its population and two-thirds of them were women who were traveling to the West for work and this left behind, literally and metaphorically, a lot of angry white men who didn't really have a place in the new Germany. Mm -hmm. So do we have a case of uh, raging testosterone in uh, Eastern Germany? I don't think it's as simple as, as that. I think it's a multi-layered um, answer, but I think part of the puzzle might be the place of the East German man in German society. Mm -hmm. and, and women did move to uh, Western Germany, or some of them at least, because? Why, why didn't men follow suit? Communism was quite successful in creating a broad class of independent, emancipated women who were often better educated than the men and found it easier to find work in the West than the East German male labourer they left behind. Very briefly, Ayman, uh, do you think AFD will make strides in the European election? I think they will, but one thing we should not overlook is that it's not just them. Um, I was surprised in Chemnitz how many green supporters and green activists mm. I met. And while it might be true that Germany's political centre is collapsing a little, that's not, it's not just the far right who gains. Parties like the, green are, the Greens are gaining support too. Okay, well, we'll uh, find out soon. Won't we'll we? see. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for watching Insiders Unreported Europe. We'll be back soon.